Hey folks, thanks for tuning in today. If you have a Bible in one way, shape, or form, get to Psalm 42. We're going to explore Psalm 42 in the next Psalm, Psalm 43. They're, they're kind of connected. There's a condition that gets discussed in these Psalms that's where a whole lot of us are or have been, especially over the last year and a half and the challenge of going through a pandemic and the lingering impact of it all. See if you can identify with the condition that's going on in Psalm 42 and 43. Now, in verse 1 of Psalm 42, it gives this condition in metaphorical form, and then verse 2 explains the metaphor. First off, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water. All right, so what's described here is not like Bambi hanging out in the wild with Rossini's opera playing in the background, maybe getting a sip of some high-quality H2O down at the riverbed. The deer is panting. And a panting deer isn't a thirsty deer. A panting deer is literally a deer that's dying of thirst. And therefore, a panting deer is a deer that's come down to the water in order to quench their thirst, only to find the riverbed dry. And the psalmist is saying, I'm like the deer, and God's like the dry riverbed. And verse 2 explains, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The psalmist can't sense God the personal sense that there's a God who's there and I'm dealing with him and he's dealing with me, the give and take, it's just gone. And then he says, when can I go and meet with God? Literally, when shall I see the face of God? Verse five actually says something similar too. And this doesn't mean he's lost his belief in God. It means he's lost his relational experience of God's presence. Thoughts about God that used to comfort him or strengthen him, they don't resonate, they don't strike him, they don't do it anymore. He no longer feels like he's got a hold on God. He no longer has a sense that there's a God who's there and that he's in a personal relationship with. He, he's experiencing spiritual dryness, spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual deadness. And one thing that's important to see here is that there are other Psalms in which the spiritual dryness and deadness coexist with the sense of guilt. In other words, there are a number of other psalms where the reason why the psalmist has lost the sense of God's reality is because the psalmist has done something wrong, and therefore the psalmist feels guilt, and then he has to confess his sin and has to repent. But we need to notice that that's not happening here. The psalmist is experiencing a deep spiritual drought, and he's done nothing wrong. It's just come on him. And this is important for us to get because in our culture, we have this approach that if something's wrong... We want to know who's to blame so we can point the finger at them and maybe even sue them. I mean, we're a litigating society, aren't we? In other words, nothing should be wrong. And if something is wrong, then somebody's to blame. Somebody is to sue. Somebody gets canceled. And it's the same thing with our faith. If something's off, if something's wrong, if I start to experience spiritual drought and dryness and deadness, then we say, I'm sure there's some button I'm not pushing. I'm sure there's something on my Christian... I don't know, to-do list, we could say, that I'm missing. Or, or we'll say, well, I just need something new, a new church maybe. And so most often we switch churches and all. Unfortunately, we're a little moralistic about this, and it's sometimes one of the reasons why it's tough for Christians overall to admit to their Christian friends just how deeply dry they might be. Because there's this possibility that their Christian friends might react by saying something along the lines of, what do you mean you're not experiencing the reality of God in your life? But you're not sensing his presence. I mean, have you prayed enough? Have you confessed all your sin? Have you thanked God for all your blessings? I mean, surely there would be nothing wrong if you're just doing the right stuff, doing everything that's on the to-do list. But this guy's not doing anything wrong. I mean, there's no confession here. And yet he's dying of spiritual thirst. And here's the point. This condition, it will come upon you. It just simply will. It will happen to you. And of course, spiritual dryness and deadness can happen to you as a result of you doing something wrong. But the point is it can happen without that, even if you're doing all those things on the daily Christian to-do list. And, And when we're faced with this, when spiritual drought happens, we generally don't treat it very well. Here's a little baseball analogy. Remember when we used to play baseball in Baltimore? Those were the days, right? Well, let's just say somebody hits a routine ground ball to the shortstop and the shortstop bobbles it. They they make a mistake. They make an error and they end up compounding it by rushing it a bit, picking up the ball and then throwing it away because they rush it. They make two errors. Don't make two errors. Uh, uh, Or how about golf? 
You hit a ball into the woods, and instead of just taking your medicine and punching it back out of the woods, there's a small window that you see there where you can actually go forward to the green, just a small window between the trees. And after all, trees are 80% air, right? So you end up taking a big old swing and a big old hack and you go through the window there in the trees, but you end up hitting a tree again and it bounces back behind you where you're in worse shape than before, you know? You should have just punched out onto the fairway and taken your medicine, but we don't. We compound it all. Some of you are like, Dave, you sure do know a lot about making errors and hitting bad shots into the woods. Yes, I do. Anyway, what do we do? We compound it. And that's how it is with spiritual dryness. I mean, it's bad when it happens, but by and large, we boot the ball. It comes to us, but that's not enough. And because we don't act on it and know how to deal with it or react the way we see here in Psalm 42 as to how we should be acting, then we boot the ball. We take another bad shot. We compound the problem. So figuring out how to deal with this condition is crucial because it will come to all of us. Now, one of the things we see here in Psalm 42 are some of the causal factors. There's several causal, fa causal factors that are mentioned here that tend to go along with this condition. And one of them is a disruption of community, which is something we've had to deal with over the last year and a half, no doubt. I mean, notice verse four there. He writes, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Then down a couple of verses, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Mazar. All right, a little geography here. It'll help us understand what's going on. And we don't know why this happened, but he used to be in the southern part of Judah and he used to go to the temple and be a regular part of the worship at the temple and part of the feasting and the joy and the praise and all that. But now he's in the northern part. He, he's away from the people, away from the feasting, away from the temple, away from the worship. He's up in the north on the mountain range of which Mount Hermon is the peak. And we don't know why he's there. We don't know if he's captured. We don't know if he's exiled. We don't know if he's moved up there. We don't know if there's a pandemic. We don't know why. But the point is there's individual Bible study and then there's corporate Bible study. There's individual prayer and then there's corporate community prayer. And they are not the same. We need them both. For example, he longs for and remembers fondly the festive throng. The festive throng, literally, it means a pilgrim feast. Well, what was a pilgrim feast? It, it was something very similar to what we do here at 8009 Corporate Drive. It's very similar to what we do here in this room that I'm in. It's like their version of Food Truck Sunday that we had last week, which we're having another one at the beginning of next month. You don't want to miss it. But the feasts were times when the people of God corporately remembered the great acts of God that he did in order to make them a people. For example, the Passover was one of the feasts. People came from all over and they read the Bible about the Exodus and the great things that God did and about how God made them a people. And then they recommit themselves and they worship God together. You see, it's a group Bible study. It's group prayer. It's group worship. And we, particularly as Americans, we downplay the importance of communal spiritual disciplines. We're hyper-individualistic. I mean, over and over again, surveys show that 85 to 90% of Americans say, hey, I can be a good Christian, I can be a spiritual person without going to a church. I mean, I can be a spiritual person without being a part of some institution. I can be a very good spiritual person all by myself. 85 to 90% year after year say that. But you can't. <laughs> I mean, it's a setup for a disaster. It's, and it's actually antithetical to the whole of Christianity. I mean, all by yourself? How do you know you're right about anything all by yourself? I mean, how do you know your interpretation, your perspective, your conclusions, your understanding? How do you know they hit the mark? How do you kind of, I don't know, stay fired up all by yourself? How do you stay hot all by yourself? Who will encourage you or admonish you or challenge you or affirm you? Who will you pray with? 
Who will you learn with? Who will you talk with about your spiritual journey? Now, when we're all by ourselves, we usually end up inventing our own version of faith if we go it on our own. We kind of mix and mesh all sorts of conflicting, inconsistent ideologies. And a lot of times we don't even know it because we're all by ourselves. Well, the writer here in Psalm 42, he doesn't underestimate the disruption of community. But we tend to, and as a result, we fall into spiritual dryness because we want to come as individuals. We want to get our, our little fix. We want to get a little message, get a little music, maybe get a, a little bit of fix, and then we go home. We go on our way, maybe talk to one or two acquaintances. But we don't really want to make ourselves accountable, and we don't want to become a regular part of a small group or regular prayer. We don't want any of that. We're, we're too busy or we're just too private or some other reason. The CCC, I'm telling you, we won't get away with it. And let me just say one other thing about this. People are constantly coming and going. One of the most challenging parts of being involved in the church are the all too often times when people move away. The stats actually show that about 11% of our area moves away every year, and the church is impacted by that. So it's not that uncommon for somebody or some family who's sunken into CCC and they come up to me and they say, hey, this is our final week here at CCC. We're moving to, I don't know, Florida or Arizona or South Carolina or wherever. And if you're someone who's here for any length of time, you know, if you're here year after year, you're going to find that unless you're actively kind of reconstructing your smaller community that you're connected to through a small group or a ministry team. And then you're going to find yourself at Mount Mazar if you don't reconstruct yourself wondering, where did everybody go? You and I can fall into spiritual dryness because we lose our community or we leave it or we drift away. And I think this has been one of the most significant impacts of the pandemic, the disruption of gathering as a community. So you got to be intentional about it. It's got to be a high priority to stay connected to the collective church. Now, that's not the only causal factor mentioned in Psalm 42, though. Another one has to do with the disillusionments at the events of life. You see this in verse 3 there. The questions ask, where is your God? So there are folks from the outside that are sort of taunting him and saying, where's your God? And you don't ask that question, where's your God, unless things don't really fit in with the idea of a good, holy, loving, and just wise God. See, the question, where is your God, it usually goes like this. If he's your God... If he really is for you, if he's really the God that you say he is, then why is all this stuff happening around you? And it's not just a question that's asked from outside, because in verse 9, the psalmist himself asked the same question. Verse 9 says, I say to God, why have you forgotten me? See, things go wrong sometimes. It's very hard to explain. It's very hard to understand. Sometimes things are inexplicable. And you say, why would God have allowed that? And that's another causal factor, the disillusionment at the events of life. And then another one that's mentioned there, physical deprivation is a causal factor. Check out verse 3. It says, my tears have been my food day and night. So he's saying, I'm not eating. Tears are all I'm eating. And so the first thing he's getting at is he stopped eating. He's lost his appetite. But notice also he's not sleeping because he's weeping all night. And you don't weep all night if you sleep. So he's not eating and he's not sleeping. And what this means is that you and I are not going to be able to deal with the overall condition if we ignore the fact that there can be a physical aspect to it. And for the psalmist here, the lack of eating and sleeping is aggravating the situation. See, we tend to be pretty dualistic in that we pit the body and the spirit against each other. And we, when we look at the spiritual discouragement or somebody who says, I just don't feel God, we have a tendency to ignore the physical, but we shouldn't because the physical and spiritual are inextricably linked. There are people who say, listen, everything's basically physical. So if you're discouraged or depressed, you know, life is one dimensional. It's physical. So take your medicine, that kind of thing. And there's another kind of person who reduces everything to the moral. If you're discouraged or you're depressed, you know, just pull yourself together, you know, Stop sniveling, keep a stiff, a stiff upper lip, that kind of thing. And then there's a third kind of person who doesn't reduce everything to the physical. 
or the moral who reduces everything to the psychological and emotional. So if you're discouraged or depressed, then we're going to listen to you and we're going to accept you. And then we're going to listen to you some more and we're going to support you. And we're going to listen to you some more and we're going to accept you. And we're going to listen to you and listen to you and listen to you. But the Bible says you have an emotional aspect and therefore you need friends and you have a physical aspect. So you need rest and food and maybe medicine, but you also have a spiritual aspect and you need truth. And as a result, if we have a Christian worldview and a Christian view of human nature, then we should almost be the most balanced of all people. We have to recognize all these things are involved. And if we look at the cures here, which we're about to, we'll see an incredible balance throughout them. So here are some of the cures listed out here in Psalm 42 and 43. There are several things this psalmist does that we got to do too when this condition comes upon us. To start with, he pours out his soul. He says this in verse four there. He says, you know, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. And this is so ironic here. He says, I don't feel God. I get nothing out of worship. I get nothing out of prayer. I don't sense him there at all. And yet what's he doing here in Psalm 42 and 43? I mean, they're essentially an eloquent, theologically rich, sustained, reflective prayer and meditation. In other words, And this is the first thing we got to do. If you don't get anything out of worship in this dry time, don't miss it. If you get nothing out of prayer, don't miss it. If you get nothing out of Bible reading, well, don't miss it. Pour out your soul. You say, I don't feel anything, Dave. Well, fine. Then talk about that. If nothing else, talk to God about how you're getting nothing out of it. If nothing else, talk to God about how much you miss him. If nothing else, talk to the seemingly absent God about his absence. So the first thing is don't ignore those sort of spiritual disciplines. In fact, be more disciplined about them than you've ever been before. Number one, he pours out his soul. Number two, he analyzes his hopes. And there's a refrain that comes up three times. And this refrain It's somewhat a theme that runs through here. In verse 5, verse 11, and verse 5 of Psalm 43, it's almost repetitious. And he says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Three times he does that. He asks that question, why so downcast, my soul? And what he's doing is some self-examination. He's kind of looking for some answers. Specifically, he's looking for his hopes. He says, why am I so cast down? What's because I've put my hopes in some things that are now letting me down? Spiritual dryness is a perfect time to examine your heart because spiritual dryness, it reveals inordinate loves, false hopes, idols, essentially. A clear, clear example of this is actually in Psalm 3, which is about when when David, King David, he's on the run for his life because his favorite son, Absalom, had actually pulled off a revolt and, and had taken over David's throne. And now he's hunting down David, his father, and trying to kill him so that he could have the kingship. And there were two things that had been the source of David's identity. And, and really, I mean, we may think of it as his glory. Two things he thought made him matter. And one was the love of his son and his family, and the other was the love and acclaim of his people. And he lost both of them. And yet, right in the middle of Psalm 3, verse 3, he says, But you, O Lord, are my shield. You are my glory and the lifter of my head. You see what he's doing here? He's analyzing. He's saying, My son used to be my glory. My people used to be my glory. And I've lost them and it hurts me, but I'm not devastated because what I'm doing in this moment is I'm relocating my hopes. I'm relocating my glory in you, God, in your smile and your love and your support and your approval. I've got that, he says. And if I've got that, I'm just not going to be devastated by the loss of anything. I will lift up my head anyway, he says. And that's what's happening here in Psalm 42 and 43 as well. Some of you, you might remember Sylvester Stallone. He became this icon on the big screen through a character that he played named Rocky Balboa. 
there have been like 73 Rocky movies, but the first one, the one that won three Academy Awards, it was nominated for 10, it, but it actually won three Academy Awards and it came out in 1976 and it introduced us to Rocky Balboa, who was the tough, gutsy, never quit Southpaw boxer from Philadelphia. So Rocky Balboa, the night before he's to take on the heavyweight champion of the world, who's Apollo Creed, he's talking to Adrian, who would become his wife eventually. And he's saying to her, nobody's ever gone the distance with Apollo Creed. Nobody's ever gone all 15 rounds of a fight with Creed. And then he says in the most important line in the film, if I can just go the distance, I'll know I'm not a bum. I'll know I'm not a bum. And I would suspect that everyone has something, just like Rocky did. You've got something that you believe and you kind of talk to yourself about it. And you say, if I can just have that or get that or do that or achieve that or accomplish that or acquire that, then I'll know I'm not a bum. Then I'll have some worth and value. And we've all got something that we kind of put our hopes in in that way or some things. And in some cases, it's a relationship. It might be some sort of status or financial security. It might be achievement or an accomplishment. It's different for everybody. But I'll bet you either have this dialogue with yourself or you wrestle with this idea that there are some things in your life that you look at and you say, if I could just have that, th then I know I've got some value and worth. Then I won't be a bum. If my kids turn out right, if my kids get good grades, if I just get that promotion, if I just get that title, if I just make this amount of money or have that number in my bank account, or if I just get into that school or whatever it is, we could go on and on and on. But we place our hopes in this thing. And I'll tell you, in times of dryness, that's the time to examine what you're putting your hopes in. But what are the things you really, really rest in and you think they bring you significance? Well, don't rest so much in them. Kind of relocate your hope, shift your hope. And that's what the psalmist is doing here. Finally, he remembers the loving kindness of God. You notice in verse six there, he writes, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember. And he's not just thinking about and remembering God in a general way, but in verse eight, he says, by day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Now, what he's done is he's turned this whole thing into a song. And this is not a psalm of David. This is a psalm of one of the sons of Korah. And early in their Bible, it tells us the sons of Korah were professional musicians. They were full-time artists. And notice this one is a string instrumentalist. I mean, at the end, he says, I'll pick up my harp again someday. And what he's doing is he's turning the truth of God and the grace of God into a song that he kind of sings to himself even at night, to remind himself what he's learned to do through song or otherwise is to kind of preach to his heart. And you'll notice he's not talking to us here. He, he's not talking to some other audience through this psalm. He's saying, why so downcast, O my soul? And this is really key. We'll never learn to get out of spiritual dryness unless we learn to do this. He's listened to his heart. He's poured his heart out. He's analyzed his hopes. He's thought about the grace and love of God. But it's at one point he stops listening to his heart and he starts talking to his heart. In times of spiritual dryness and discouragement, I mean, every morning you wake up and your heart's kind of talking to you, it's chattering to you. Oh man, this is terrible and that's terrible and this is awful and that's awful. And at some point you have to grab your heart and you have to say, listen, just shut up and listen, you know. And this guy has learned to kind of preach to his own heart. Do you know how to preach to your own heart? If you've listened to your heart so that you found its false hopes, at some point you have to turn around and learn to preach the grace of God and the goodness of God and the truth of God, the gospel of God to yourself. Do you know how to do this? When you take yourself in hand and you say, hey, why are you like this? You've forgotten this and you've forgotten that. It's an absolutely essential skill. And what's the result? Notice what he says here. He doesn't say, hope in God, 
I do now praise him because that will kind of be in denial of where he is. And he doesn't say, hoping God, I'll never praise him. That would be despair. He says, hope in God, I will praise him. And if we look carefully, we'll see a progression that bit by bit by bit, he starts in the dumps and he, he moves himself to a completely different place by the end. You know, this is so important to figure out, gang, the spiritual dryness. It's nothing new. But listen, if you're finding yourself in a place of spiritual dryness right now, well, it's time to sort through it. Now's the perfect time as we get rolling into this new season and we step further into the fall. So where do you find yourself in these psalms? Where do you identify with the psalmist here? I want to encourage you to find some moments in the coming days and just read through Psalm 42 and 43 and do a little self-examination. See if you're like that deer panting, thirsting. Are there any causal factors? And what steps do you need to take right now in your life? Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God.